think obvious. What's that? You don't know until the going gets tough. Yeah, and all of a sudden, yeah, when, when the going gets tough and all of a sudden you find yourself, you know, needing people, and then you look around, and then you find out. But, I mean, you could cultivate a friendship for years and years before you ever go through a hard time when you really need somebody. And then that's when you find out that they're not there. That's, that's hard, man. I mean, you, you can start to see signs of it, of course. Like, if you're friends with somebody and you see how they behave to, towards other people, maybe you can start to get a sense of how they're going to behave towards us. But a lot of times we just think, oh, but it'll be different with, with us. You know? It's like if, um, if you have a friend, for example, who, who, you, who you see lying to other people, well, what character trait do they have? Yeah, they're a liar. And you're going to be surprised when they lie to you. It's like if you have somebody in class and you see them cheating and they're a friend of yours. Well, what do you know about their character? You, you know that, that they're dishonest. Don't be surprised when they're dishonest towards you. We'll, we'll rationalize it. And we'll say, oh, that, that's not towards me, though. It's, it's just this other person or it's just a class or it's just this. But in actuality, it's, it's a manifestation of a character trait. If you're dishonest, if you're capable of being dishonest, I mean, I guess we're all capable of being dishonest, but if you demonstrate yourself to be dishonest in one area, there's a fluidity there where you're practiced at it. You can be dishonest in every area at that point. But some, for some reason, we're surprised when people all of a sudden you know, aren't there for us. When they, they turn their backs on us, it's like, well, could you have seen it? Yeah. Should you have seen it? Yeah. But it's almost like we walk through this world with, our, with these like, self-imposed... Um, blindfolds on where we don't want to see the obvious because the obvious I mean let's be honest it's just sheer fucking terror you know because when the time comes that you're going to actually need to have somebody around and when you're at your lowest you're just really hoping you might like lift the blindfold up just a little bit and there's a terror that you may realize at that point that you, you are alone that there is nobody around that maybe there's nobody who can understand and you won't, again, know that until your back is absolutely up against the wall. And it's something that we probably all intuitively know. You know and then something really neat can happen, though, that you can find yourself with your back against the wall. And people who you never expected to, to come out of the woodwork to support you are going to come out of the woodwork to support you. You know, people who you thought were kind of your friends will be the ones who are absolutely there. And... I guess that kind of also begs the question of if that's the person that, that you want to be as well. Are you that person who is going to be there for other people, who's going to demonstrate those character traits to, to, to be supportive and, and to have their back? Or does it kind of depend on, on like your level of connection to them? In other words, are you a person who's kind of responsive to other people? Well, I'll be there for them because they're a close friend of mine. Or are you a person who demonstrates a character trait? I'm there for people, period. I've got their back, period. And in the first case, it's, if it's just like I had the back of just the people who are close to me, then that's almost like a, like a transaction. I've got their back because I think that they have my back. I hope that they have my back. Versus the other case there, which is you can know, absolutely. And so there is, there is something absolutely there that, that there's a world that you can create problem is that when you create a world, it's created. It's not real. It's fictional. And, and we know that it is. And you're going back to that thing about, about lying. What's, what's wrong with lying? If I ask you that question, really think about it. Like, what's wrong with lying? It's like you're not the truth. It's like you're hiding. Yeah, but what's wrong with that? What's wrong with hiding? What do you mean morally correct? Where does that come from? racist, but go ahead. (laughs) 
That's okay. <laughs> <laughs> it goes back to being normal. You don't want to lie. Yeah. But why not? Like, everything you're saying is true. Everything that you're saying is, is true, not a lie. But there's that thing of, like, why, if it's, a, if it's a deadly sin, why do we take it to be so serious? In other words, why is it such a big deal? Does anybody in here not lie? A bunch of liars. What's that? I wanted to see the liars racing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I do not lie. Now, first off, if you know someone who's a liar, you've got to be really careful with them. Because liars are, are weak. Liars are weak people. Weak people have to lie. Weak people have to lie. It's their only means of defense. They can't stand up to the truth. They can't tell you the truth. Because if they tell you the truth, then they're going to have to face you. If they tell the truth to somebody else, they're going to have to face that person, which means facing the consequences of it. It takes a strong person to face the consequences. It's easy. For, a, for a liar, it's, it's impossible to face the consequences. That's why they're lying. And think about the kinds of things that you lie about and how small they are. And we might be like, oh, it's just a little white lie, but don't those things kind of compound and become big lies? In other words, don't we get used to lying? Like how often, really think about it during the course of a day, do you, do you say something that's not true? And even if you don't think of it as a lie. Like, how are you guys doing today? How are you guys today? Okay. Liars. <laughs> maybe. Maybe you are okay. Or maybe there's something else that's kind of going on. And I'm like, well, yeah, but I don't want to just say, you know, doing terribly, dying inside. <laughs> you know? And maybe the idea is because nobody really wants to hear it. Whatever your reasoning is, you said something that wasn't true, didn't you? And now, how many of those little things can we justify to pile up? It's just this, or it's just that, or it's just this one thing. But that's how we get used to lying. And all of it is rationalizing. Oh, I'm lying because of, and fill in the blank. Or it's not that big of a deal, fill in the blank. These are all rationalizations. Again, you have to be very careful if you come across somebody who's lying a lot, because, especially if it's your friend, because you know that they're a weak person. They're going to turn their back on you. And if you're somebody who does a lot of lying yourself, it's the same thing. It's not a popular thing to tell you, but you need, to, you need to examine yourself because there's something about you that makes you feel like you cannot exist in the world of reality. And I mean that. When you're lying to somebody, you think about how there's this, like, a, a trajectory of life, let's say, and we'll call that reality. This is what's happening in, in reality. Things are, things are literally what they are. Now, and I mean that literally, not like the, the, the slang version of literally, but in other words, it's really like this. When you lie to a person, why? Because you are afraid of the consequences of living in this reality. So what do you, have to, what do you feel like you have to do? Well, what you have to do is you feel like you have to tell somebody a lie, and now when you do that, they're no longer living in reality. They're living according to a, a false reality. They're living a fiction. If you tell a person, um, somebody asks you, where did you go yesterday? Oh, I went to the mall. But you didn't go to the mall. You went home. They're now living in a world in which they believe that you went to the mall. A small thing. But now start thinking about the big kinds of lies that you tell people. And what you're going to notice is that when you do that, that changes the trajectory of people's lives. That changes the trajectory of people's lives. People will be living differently. You tell somebody, oh, you're absolutely my best friend. Now they're living in a world that they really believe that you're their best friend. And that means that they believe that they can depend on you. And now when it, when it really comes down to it, they can't depend on you. That's when they find out how, how wide this chasm is between reality and this thing that you've spun. That's really what lying is. It's just trying to take control of another person's life. I don't want you to behave in this way, be angry with me, um, to get me in trouble. I don't want to feel bad by telling you the truth, whatever the reason is. So you lie because you want to avoid the, the, the consequences. You want to avoid having to deal with those things. You're creating a false reality. And now start thinking about it. How many of us are living in these absolute false realities? How many of us indulge in these false realities? We look at stuff on Instagram. We know it's not real. We know that the pictures and the lives and the personalities are not real. But we indulge in them. Why? I don't know, man. I guess I'm going to ask you, what is the, what is the reality that's, that is frightening you so much that you have to run away from it knowingly? We knowingly engage in these things. Not just lying to other people, but we get lied to. 
and we're happy with it. So why is it that we're so afraid of reality? What is it that has us so terrified that we indulge in this separation from it? We don't know like what comes next. Explain. <clears throat> like a lot of things that we like to look at in our regular lives, we kinda know what we're like to expect, but like later in reality we don't really know what's gonna come. Because like we have we have like no idea what's there yet. Yeah. We're afraid of the unknown. Yeah. There's a terror of the unknown. And we have a tendency to populate the unknown with our imaginations. In other words, we don't know what's, up, what's on the other side of, of death, so we kind of imagine and we, we, we project into it. In a very real sense, um, when you guys were little kids, what, what was in your closet when you were five years old? Don't say your uncle. <laughs> <laughs> but along those lines, what was in your closet when you were five years old? Come on, you were five. Monsters. Yeah. And what do monsters look like? Come on, dude. You can ignore her, but don't ignore me. What do monsters look like? Big. They're big? Like six eyes. Six eyes. Bunch of arms. Bunch of arms. Sharp teeth. Sharp teeth. Yeah. Essentially, it's the opposite of what you are. You know, you look at now, have any, when, when all of you guys were little kids, did any of you see a monster? How would you possibly have an idea what a monster looks like? Imagine your parents didn't sit there and say, all right, now go to sleep. Because you need to be care. If you don't, you need to be careful of the six-eyed, furry, giant, sharp-toothed monster that's in that closet right there. <laughs> anyway, sweet dreams. You know, you might say, "Well, I saw Monsters Inc." But Monsters Inc. Those monsters came from somewhere. That's like the popular imagination of what monsters look like. And so, when you're looking into the closet, what do you see in the closet? Well, there's nothing in there. You guys know what a Rorschach test is? The ink blot test? Yeah. Yeah. You pour ink on a page. You and I hold it up and I ask you, "What does this look like?" And you look and you go. Looks like my dad, okay? If you show me a blank piece of paper, I'll say that looks like my dad. <laughs> or a car driving away and a little kid's sad. That's my dad. Or I, sh I show up another one. What's that look like to you? That's my dad yelling at me, okay? <laughs> What's this one? Well, that's my dad telling me I'm not good enough, okay? I think I figured out your problem. You have, you have some issues with your father. In other words, there's nothing on the page. It's just random, you know, ink. But whatever you see, it's, you see it because you're projecting onto the, onto the page. Whatever you're seeing is inside of you. It's not on the page, it's inside of you. And so now, that begs this question. Where does that monster really reside? Inside of you. So when you're a little kid, you have a monster inside of you. And any of you who have babysat little kids, this shouldn't be a surprise to you, yes? You know this. A little kid can become, it can be the sweetest little thing in the world and all of a sudden become a terrible monster. Like that. Why? Because the monster's inside of them. So what you see in the closet, what is it? It's not, the, it's not even necessarily the monster that you are, it's the monster that you're afraid of becoming. You, how many eyes do you have when you're a little kid? Everyone knows the answer to this. <laughs> Two eyes. And the monster, we said, has six eyes. You know, when you're a little kid, how big are you? Like Yeah, you're little. <laughs> Very good. And, how, and we just said that that monster is big. You have soft, smooth skin. They have furry, you know, or scaly skin. You have little rounded teeth, baby teeth that are gonna fall out sometime. They have big, sharp teeth. You have barely any little fingernails. They have big claws. It is the complete opposite of what you are. And that's the thing that you, that you recognize. That's what you could become. And some people do become that monster. Some people stay that monster. But that's what is in the darkness there. It's the thing that you project into it. There's nothing in there. What's in there is whatever you're imagining. We populate the unknown with our imaginations. And why? Sometimes it's because it creates a terror. Sometimes it helps us, as we get older, it helps us to avoid a terror. And so what's the terror of life that we're seeking to try to, to, try to overcome? What's the worst thing that can happen to you in life? Death. Yeah, death. And that's the thing that we're perpetually trying to overcome. Why do we build these big giant monuments? Because we want to be remembered. Why do we have families and children? Because we want to be remembered. Why is it that we join groups and, and clubs and teams? Because we want to take the absolute meaninglessness of our tiny, itty bitty little lives that exists, one of eight billion, on this little blue marble 
that circles some inconspicuous star in an, in a, in an inconsequential corner of some minor galaxy that's one of two trillion that we can look at. And we recognize in there that your life is tiny and small and that terrifies us. And at the end of all of it, what do you find? Nothingness, death. And there's a terror that can motivate us in that. And so what do we try to do? We try to deny it. We do everything that we can to deny death. We try to ignore it, pretend it doesn't happen. We create rea uh, false realities. Because these false realities, we can spin those all day. But this one is going to end at some point. This objective real reality for all of us. And so we look for things in this life to give us signs of hope of something. Maybe we're lying because our weakness is such that we can't deal with the ultimate end of life, which is death. It terrifies us. And so instead we seek to populate the unknown with something else. We've already dealt with the monsters and... Hopefully you recognize that what that means is that there's a monster inside of every little kid and every little kid grows up and what, is, and, what, and what grows up with you, that monster grows up with you. And that means it's still inside of you. It's that thing that, that tries to, to, to permeate, to pop out at some of the worst moments. And by the way, it's not a bad thing. And you should have a monster inside of you because sometimes it's necessary. No, new dude, I hope you have a monster inside of you if someone comes through that door with a shotgun. I hope you have a monster inside of you. Yeah, or I hope you're a really good negotiator. <laughs> but we can't negotiate with the monsters of life. You know, so it's sometime you may, sometimes you may have to bring out that monster. This is true. This is true. But there are some people who just live as the monster. And that's true as well. And that terrifies us. How do we deal with those monsters? Well, sometimes we create those false realities where we have to lie because we know what the ultimate end of that thing is. What's that monster that's inside of you? What's the thing that dogs you? What's the thing that bothers you late at night? The value of this world lays in its power to suggest another one. You know what? There are signs in this world that, you know what? Maybe there's a better world someplace else. Because just like those monsters come from us, I guess the question is, you know, where does so much evil in the world come from? Another great question to ask is, where does so much good come from? Because there is so much good in this world, and we miss it because we're ungrateful for it. We get so caught up on, on, the, on the, the, the few evil things that happen to us, and relatively speaking in your life, it probably is very few, even though your life is tragic. And is your life tragic? Of course it is. <laughs> you know, and people come along, it's like life is sunshine and rainbows. No, life is suffering, man. Life is suffering. You don't get to choose not to suffer. But what you can choose is what you're going to suffer for. That's freedom. You don't get the freedom to choose not to suffer. People who, who deny suffering, man, they're denying most of life. They're denying the things that, that help to project us. Those struggles that we're talking about. I want a life with no struggles. What the fuck would you look like with no struggles in your life? You know, you just, you would just be, you would just exist. How is it that you could possibly be an honest person if you never had to struggle with whether or not to tell the truth? It's being able to have the, the courage to tell the truth and to stay in alignment with reality. That's the thing that makes you stronger. That's the thing that now when, when there's a really hard truth in front of you that you have to tell, you can, you have, the, you have the strength, the courage and the experience and the wisdom to tell that truth. Otherwise, you've got the, the cowardice and the experience to tell the lie. You have to struggle in life to become stronger. But not everybody is made stronger by struggles. A lot of people, you know, you've heard that statement before, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. It comes from a very specific philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. And he says it in a very specific way, man. He says, what doesn't kill me makes me stronger. Most people are not made stronger by their struggles. Most people are, end up jaded, angry, and they don't end up a version of themselves. People get hurt and they become something else. They become someone else because reality just proved too difficult for them. And this isn't a criticism, man. This is just a narration. When you come across someone who's jaded and angry and hurt, understand it's because something in life terrified them so much, made them so uncertain, that they had to create a, a, a fiction. And we can... We can control our fictions to a degree, or at least we think we can. But 
ultimately, man, no matter how deep your fiction goes, you're going to get smacked in the face with reality. Because the truth is, is that we live in a universe that really doesn't care how we feel about it. It really doesn't care what we think about it. And in the end, it wins. What's that? And that's the reality. Yeah, that's the reality. So maybe the life that we're, maybe the world that we're, that we're creating, we're suggesting, is something fictional. But I wonder, what would happen in your life if the world that you were trying to suggest was one of yourself that's completely in alignment with reality, with the truth, the truth, not my truth, not your truth, the truth. I don't know. But if I don't stop, we're going to be here till Friday. <laughs> uh, questions, comments, concerns, complaints, criticisms, critiques? Happy Wednesday. <laughs>